Any homework questions you want me to go over? The, um, the rigid body statics went okay? Okay. Um, well, we've done rigid body statics in 2D, uh, so now we have to talk about doing it in 3D. Um, most of the class we're going to do 2D because we'll be doing big structures and stuff, but, uh, but there will be some 3D problems. I'll come back. <laughs> okay, you go where you want. Um, okay, so uh, we talked about degrees of freedom. In 2D, uh, so you have an object and it can do the following things. Uh, it can translate along one axis. It can translate along a perpendicular axis. Uh, and it can rotate about a perpendicular axis to that. Uh, you know, it, in two dimensions, the thing can only rotate in the plane. That's only one axis of rotation. So three total degrees of freedom. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, you remember how many joint categories I broke things up into last time? Three. Uh, and it's related. So each one of the loads that you can apply at a joint um, restricts one of these degrees of freedom. Okay, and it's going to work the same way in three dimensions. Uh, so three possible uh, loads can be applied by a joint in 3D, you know, and you have to figure out which ones of those three the joints apply based on uh, what motions are restricted. So this is three possible loads can be applied by a joint. Okay, in 3D, um, okay, so in 3D, you have an object like this. Um, and the degrees of freedom are translation about that axis, translation about that axis, and translation about that axis. And then a rotation about that one a rotation about that one, and a rotation about that one. Okay. Um, so now in 3D, you have three translational degrees of freedom and three rotational degrees of freedom. And so uh, joints can apply up to three force components and three couple components. Um, and uh, force vectors are going to be drawn like this, obviously, that's how they've always been drawn. But couple components, remember, are going to be drawn like this. With a double arrowhead like that, 
Okay, think of that as the, the couple, it's a couple of arrowheads, even though really they'd be going equal in opposite directions. That's just the notation we're going to use. Okay, so that indicates um, a rotation uh, in that direction. Well, what does a rotation in a direction mean? That's the right hand rule. Okay, so uh, what's a rotation in that direction? Your thumb goes that way and your fingers rotate like this. Okay, so um, this indicates a rotation like that. Okay, well, now I'm just going to go through a list because I know it seemed like it was fun yesterday with the 2D. So I'm like, let's just go through the list again. Like, let's just keep doing lists the rest of the semester. Um, so we'll go to 7D, all the joints in 7D. Not really. Okay, so I'm going to start with joint category one uh, that introduces one variable into the equations. And then we're going to go two, three, so on. Uh, what are we going to get up to? Six. Six, yeah, right. Okay, so joint category one in 3D. Uh, so just like joint category one in 2D, um, this applies a single force in a known direction. And um, it adds one variable to Newton's laws. Uh, and this is going to be the same um, the same two joints as joint category one and 2D, although you have to think of them a little different. Uh, okay, so uh, frictionless contact is in this category. Um, so if this is body one, A free body diagram of body one is just perpendicular to that surface. So it looks like that. And this is perpendicular to that surface. Um, frictionless contact. The second one is a roller. And in 3D, you can have multiple kinds of rollers. Um, so you can think of like a ball roller or a wheel roller. A wheel has a preferred direction, right? You can't. A wheel can't go outside of its track, kind of. Um, so here we're talking about a ball, not a wheel. And um, So the end would look something like that, like a rolling chair um, and a free body diagram would look like perpendicular to that surface like that.
Uh, what about the sign of R in these two cases? Positive. Positive, yep. Uh, R must be positive for both of these. Uh, a negative R would mean the ground is pulling down on the thing that can't happen. Uh, joint category two. This applies force components in two different directions. And that means it introduces two variables into Newton's laws. Um, and actually for all of the remaining categories, there's just a single joint in each one of these. Um, so the one joint that we have that introduces two variables is a wheel with a preferred direction. So, um, that would look something like this. Where did it go wrong? Yeah, that's, uh, oh, wheels are supposed to be round. <laughs> okay, let's see, come on now. Whatever, it's a wheel. Okay. Uh, and the free body diagram, okay, so there's a, this has a preferred direction. It can only roll a, along that line. And so a free body diagram uh, if this is the direction it can travel, the line that it travels along, um, it can produce a force perpendicular to the line that way. and a force perpendicular to the line that way. So I'll call it, call this one N and this one F. Are you with me on what I'm drawing there? Then joint category three. This is uh, by far the, the joint that you're gonna deal with the most in 3D problems. Um, this applies a force with an unknown direction meaning we have three unknown force components.
Um, and so what this means is all translation is restricted, but no rotations. We still haven't seen any, uh, any rotations restricted yet with any of these joints. And so this introduces three variables into Newton's laws for the three force components. And the joint, this is the one that you're going to see all the time, is a ball and socket joint. And it looks something like this. You have like a cup and then uh, a ball that can articulate in that cup. And so that thing can rotate anywhere. Um, but the two points, if you think of the center of the cup and the center of the ball, those two stay fixed to each other, okay, as the rotations happen. Uh, this is like your hip joint. Um, okay, so a free body diagram. I'll say this is the body that I'm doing the free body diagram of. Um, so you draw that as a force in the X direction, a force in the Y direction, a force in the Z direction, and you can just call this the vector R. So you have to calculate all three of those Um, okay, so the next two, uh, four and five, are the two trickiest ones to use, okay? You have, you have to treat these differently depending on the setting. Okay, so uh, joint category four. Um, so what's tricky about this is it introduces up to uh, four variables, but not always. It depends on the setting. Um, so it applies two force components, and that's always the case. Those, those you always deal with. And then there are two couple components that you sometimes use and you sometimes don't. So there's two couple components sometimes. Um, Okay, so let me draw the joint and then, uh, okay, so the only joint in this category is a pin joint. Without thrust. Um, thrust is an axial force a force along the axis. Um, and this joint would look something like this. So you have one body there. And then the pin articulates with another body Okay. 
Um, can you tell what I'm drawing from that picture? Yes. Okay. This pin, the red is a pin. It goes all the way through. Um, so if this is body one, Um, there would be a force in the x direction, a force in the y direction, no axial force because we don't have any thrust in this joint. Okay, so let me, uh, let's say this is going to be our z axis. Okay, um, our x-axis will be something like that, our y-axis will be something like that. Um, so we have a force rx, a force ry, and then we possibly have these two couple components, mx, and MY. Uh, and I'll talk about when you use MX and MY in a second. But okay, this, these are kind of small, but hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. So these are two pin joints. One has thrust and one doesn't have thrust. Um, the thing that provides thrust in this one, you can see uh, there's like two little flanges here that keep that from, it can't move along the axis, okay? And so um, this one applies thrust because if you try to go, if I try to move this body down, that flange applies a force that keeps that from happening, okay? Here's the same thing, but without thrust. This thing can move freely along the axis, okay? So this one, we haven't gotten to this kind of joint yet, but this one will have a Z component to the force along the axis, okay? Because it restricts that motion. This one doesn't have any force along that axis, okay? Um, so this is what we're dealing with right now. Um, so let's think about where these forces and, uh, and couples come from. Okay, so uh, just to orient yourself, like let's say that the z-axis is going toward you, okay? Uh, so the x-axis is this way, the y-axis is this way, okay? The point that's in contact between the joint and the body, uh, can you move the body in the x-direction? That way? No. Can I move it in the y-direction? Up. No, but I can move it in Z, okay? So we have an X force and a Y force, but no Z force, okay? And no Z force is the no thrust. That's no thrust, okay. that's right, that's right. So when we get to this one, you'll have all three of those forces. Um, now let's think about couples, okay? Well, the, the first one is, um, if think about a rotation uh, in terms of the right-hand rule. So if the Z axis is toward you, uh, a rotation in that direction is this, okay? Is that restricted? No, the joint is made to allow that motion, okay? Uh, now what about a rotation about the x-axis? So think about what that is. That would be like, so if I take the whole body and rotate it about the x-axis, that's like this, okay? The x-axis is that way. You see that? Okay. So can I, if I hold the base still, can I rotate the top piece about the x-axis? No, okay. Uh, and now the, a rotation about the y-axis would be like this. If I hold the base still, can I twist the, about the y-axis? No, so that's where those couples come from. Okay, you see that? Um, 
Okay, so when do you use the couples and when don't you is the question. Um, you don't use the couples when the joint is part of a pair of coaxial pin joints. Um, okay, so how does this work? Well, you can sort of think of this as a single joint or as a pair of pin joints, okay? So now let's think of this as a pair of pin joints, one here and one here. And those are coaxial because the axis of that joint is the same, okay? So think about now, in order to restrict, um, we said there's two rotations that this doesn't allow. It doesn't allow rotations this way about the x-axis, and it doesn't allow twisting rotations about the y-axis, right? Um, now, notice that um, those rotations can be restricted two different ways by this joint. One, one side or both sides could apply couples Okay, on their own. But second, uh, one, one of those coaxial joints could apply a force one way, and the other one of those coaxial joints could apply a force the other way. So like working together, they could apply a couple. Okay, and they're much, a joint like this is much better if you have the two coaxial pin joints. It's much better at restricting rotation by applying those forces farther apart than it is by applying those forces closer together, you know? Um, like imagine if you just had one of these pin joints and someone asked you to break this joint, one of the first things you'd try to break this joint would be to make it apply a couple. You'd try to twist it to break it, you know? Joints just, the closer together those forces are in the couple, the more damaging those are. And so joints are going to do a better job at applying that couple by applying forces at a distance. Okay. And so the answer, the bottom line to all that is um, if you have two pin joints that share an axis, the joints themselves don't apply a couple. The forces create the couple for you. Okay. Like the fact that they're each applying forces allows that couple to be done just using those forces. And since they're at a distance, that's why it's not a couple, because it's not... It's well, you could think... Joint. Yeah. Okay. You could think of it as a couple, but, I mean, it would be a couple plus... Um, like, basically, if those are two unknown forces, take an equal and opposite, equal and opposite components of that, that would give you a couple. Then there's some extra that, like, might as well lump it all together into two unknown forces. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. Um, okay, so um, let's think of a hinge joint in two cases. Um, This is part of the same type of joint. This uh, hinge is the type of joint that we just did, although 
Uh, it's hard to find hinge joints that don't apply thrust, I guess, but um, I'm just trying to get across when you use these couples and when you don't. Um, Okay, so on the left side, there's no two coaxial joints. Um, so this hinge applies couples. On this side, there's two coaxial joints. Um, so the hinge doesn't apply couples. For the most part, you'd rather not rely on joints to provide, on this kind of joint to provide a couple. Like um, if I open this door uh, and hung on it, you know, like, yeah, to some extent, it would provide a couple that would keep the door from bending down, you know, but not for very long because they just don't do that very well. You know what I mean? And so you'd rather not rely on a joint to do that. Okay, joint category five. What do you think that's going to be? Thrust. What? Thrust. Yes, exactly. Yep. So same exact thing. Um. But this time there's going to be a force that keeps the two things from sliding along the axis relative to each other. Um, so this is just like um, the pin joint without thrust. except now it also applies a force along the axis of the, of the hinge. So now it applies a force along the axis. Um, And so there are always three forces. And there's also two couple components sometimes. Okay, so um, this is a case where, so notice that in the last one, I drew this joint uh, with this pin with no flanges on it to, to restrict motion along the pin. That's like this thing, you know, it can, to any extent that we care about, eventually it'll run into these things, you know. But the idea is that in the range of motion that you're dealing with, it's free to move in either direction, okay? Um, so now we have the flanges there. This thing can't translate toward you, up or down, and it also can't translate along the axis. Okay, so the difference is uh, now we have this flange in place, um, so let me see if I can get that across. Uh, so here's one of the flanges. Um, there's the body. Uh, 
Then uh, there's another flange on the other side. There's a pin connecting those. Okay, so not bad. Um, we'll call the axis of rotation the z-axis. So there's z. Uh, and then x and y just have to be perpendicular to those. So something like that. Uh, so a free body diagram. Uh, you would have three force components. Um, and I'll just write that as I guess R is what I've been using. I'll just write that as the force vector R, okay? And now there can be two components of couples. Um, well, it's still a pin joint. It's still free to move along ab about the axis, to rotate about the axis. So the two couple components are going to be here and here. So this would be your MX, your MY, and then there's no Z couple. Uh, and the reasoning for when you use those couples and when you don't is the same as it is in the no thrust case. Um, if it's part of a pair, of pin joints that share an axis. Don't include the couples. Any questions about that? So only this five variable one and the four variable one, uh, the pin joints, whether they have thrust or not, um, those are the only ones where you have to consider the situation to determine what, uh, what loads are applied. Everything else just applies its loads the same no matter how it's, or, uh, how it's set up in the problem. Okay. Uh, and then the last one. Joint category six, who can tell me what this one has to be? Well. What? Well. Yes, exactly. Yes. So yeah, fixed joint or a weld joint. And this applies a full vector of forces and a full couple vector. Um, So this would look something like um, and I'll say this is the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. So then a free body diagram would look like
a force vector, I'll call that R, and then a couple vector, with components in all three of those directions, and I'll call that M. Um, well, let's start an example problem, at least get the free body diagram done, because really, uh, Drawing the free body diagram with all of these rigid body statics problems is is all that like all of this stuff that we've been talking about with the joints is just telling you how to draw that free body diagram. Um, from there, we're just going back to the stuff we've already been doing. Um, so, okay, let's say uh, we have this plate. And it's connected to the wall by a ball and socket joint. So, that's a ball and socket joint. Um, and uh, let's see, we have a cable I'm going to move this a little. Okay, we have a cable that's connected from this point at the end. Let me get this out of the way too. Um, to a point B that's on the wall, and uh, then we have another cable, uh, that's one, that's one, so we have another cable connected to this point on the wall. Um, and now we need some dimensions. Uh, so this is one meter. This is one meter. Uh, this is two meters. This is 1.5 meters. This is 0.5 meters. This is two meters. And the height of the thing is, I guess it's not going to come into the calculations, but uh, let's say the height is one meter. Um, so the question is, what are the cable tensions? and the reaction loads at the joint.
Okay, so a free body diagram. Uh, so we have the plate. There's going to be a weight force acting down from the center. Uh, oh, I, I didn't give the mass, but I have it. Uh, so let's say the mass is 50 kilograms. So the weight force is 50 times 9.81, so 490.5. Um, this is a ball and socket joint, and a ball and socket joint applies a full force vector, but no couples, okay? Because remember, uh, it can't translate in any dimension, in any direction, but it can rotate about, say, X, Y, and Z, okay? So we'll represent this as a full force vector. I'll call that R. And then the only other place that the surroundings make contact with the body, the only other two places are at this cable. I'll call this uh, T1. And this cable, I'll call that T2. Um, now we're basically ready to solve that statics problem. Uh, the last kind of difficult thing that we have to do is figure out the unit vectors related to those two cable forces. We'll do that by figuring out, you know, the coordinates of the beginning point and the ending point for each one. We'll find the vector between them. Then we'll take a unit vector in that direction. Then we'll multiply it by T or T1 or T2 or whatever. And then we'll be ready to go. Um, okay, does this seem like it's solvable? I mean, that's always, yes, question? Would we need the thickness of the plate since one of the cables is directly in the uh, we are going to treat this thing like it has no thickness. Everything's happening right in the middle of it, so that doesn't really come into it, yeah. Um, normally on problems like this, you would ignore that, but I, I mean, if I had drawn one of these on this outer edge and one of these on the other edge, then I guess to be real accurate, you'd have to take that into account. Um, okay, can we solve this? Uh, well, how many variables do we have and are we gonna have in Newton's laws? It's right there. We have three for R and then T1 and T2. So we have five variables. Uh, how many equations are we gonna get from Newton's laws? Six. Six. So we have enough equations to solve for those variables. There could be some weirdness with the fact that we have five variables instead of six variables. I think what we're gonna see when we go through this problem is that one of those equations, probably one of the um, one of the couple component equations, is going to end up saying zero equals zero, and it's just going to disappear. You see that a lot on these kind of problems. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions about that? Yes. So for the two hinge thing, not having couples, that just Kind of technically, one is experiencing like full pull force, and the other is experiencing a full push force. Yes. Okay. That's right. And then they might be, they might have other stuff going on in addition to that. Yeah. So, like for example, if you hung on the door, the top one's going to pull. Yes. The bottom one's pushing. Perfect. It. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly right. As opposed to, and you can imagine if I took the bottom hinge off the door and hung on it, it would do a lot worse. It, so if you did that, is the middle still technically kind of experiencing a couple on the middle hinge or no? Oh, um, like if you have three. They tend to experience uh, couples until they deform enough. The thing is like, it takes a very small deformation to, for the couple of an individual force to go away. 
You know what I mean? And so it tends to like pretty quickly just get to the point where those two are each just applying their own forces. Got it. Got okay. It. Good. I mean, you can imagine like if I uh, do, I, I don't really have, but say that this only only one side went through like one of these hinges, you know, it would apply a little couple, but you could see it deform pretty quickly, you know. Um, I mean, it would deform a large amount compared to if I put it through both of them. Uh, that small deformation is going to mean that the couple applied by the two together is going to be a factor. And the, the deformation, uh, I didn't get that across well at all, but um, because couples from individual joints deform a relatively large amount, uh, deform the, the uh, joint a relatively large amount, you're going to end up having the forces applied by the two joints predominate over the, over the couple applied by one joint. It's just, a, it's just a factor of like deformations, you know? And I mean, it deforms a lot, like, like I said, like if you wanted to break something, you'd make it apply a couple over and over again, you know, because it just deforms things a lot. Any other questions? Okay, that's all. Hi. Hey, this is more of a set question. Yeah. Curiosity. So, say you have where there's a cutout here, mm -hmm. here, and then a cutout on this side. Yeah. So you can rotate it like that. Yeah. Are you, then you have another. You have one couple. So instead of yeah, like going back up to here, let me just stop. Just oh, where did that guy go? 